today, she's recognized more from the point of her advocacy for detection, prevention, and the spread of awareness about a disease that everyone is afraid of and doesn't want talking. So, Sunali, I'd like to put my hands together for you to do that. That requires great courage. And uh, you yourself are a television uh, personality, a film personality, and what you say makes a difference. There are a large number of doctors out here, but there are a large number of medical administrators out here. And we'd love to hear you. Because you bring that patient's perspective into what is the most crucial aspect of care in medicine, and that is the quality of care, which results in better outcome. To bring a professional touch to it from a non-medical person, mind you, other than me, there is not a single doctor on this panel. Uh, is Praveen Nichara. Now, Praveen, I have known as a market researcher for a number of years, over 20, 25 years. He's a Bombay guy uh, from Narsimonji College, and uh, he now is the CEO of Hansa, whom you all will be in peace after you've finished. <laughs> Dr. Puri, everyone at CAHO, and uh, thank you very much for that <coughs> glorious introduction. You know, I don't know if in medicine you have the concept of self-inflicted injury. <clears throat> the nurses here would know about it. When a person hurts himself knowingly and then derives some pleasure out of it. Dr. Puri, it is a mix of sadism and masochism that makes you do that. When you want to hurt yourself. I'm sorry, but all of you want to do the same thing because you've called me on stage. <coughs> there must be some reason. It can't be love. You know, you suffer me through the week and then on the weekend also you want to call me. So I told my friend Joy, why are you doing this? And then to make it worse, you have also given me two mics here. Do I need two mics? And then, Dr. Puri, you know, when I was in Delhi University, we were told, when I was a debater in Hindu college, we were clearly told when we go for a debate, three minutes, 30 seconds. And after that, every 10 seconds, there will be a buzzer. You've done the third mistake. You've not given me my time limit. You don't know me well enough. <laughs> so, and then anyway, we are in a good mood nowadays because we are in the middle of an election. <clears throat> it gives me great pride to be here before you today because it's a... It's a mammoth effort that you are making, which humbles me. And I don't want to give lectures, but I will say one thing to you. When we have an opportunity, we must grab it. Politicians are being forced to become more sensitive to people's issues. We have discussed every irrelevant subject in every election at least since the time that I have observed it from school till now. We have discussed caste, we have discussed religion, we have discussed sub-castes, religions, wood banks. <clears throat> the one thing we have never discussed is people's issues. And then somewhere around 2007, 8, 9, I believe, and you cannot blame the media for it. In fact, I think the media has contributed greatly to making people's issues a matter of public debate. Now the question goes into what are people's issues? We are crossing the boundaries every day. So we've said people first, no compromise. <clears throat> there are some people in uniform here, must be from the Army Medical Corps. We also say forces first, no compromise. We say army first, no compromise. And the sum total of all this we say, nation first, no compromise. What in Hindi we say, Rashtra Sarvopari. Rashtra Sarvopari. But 
But if, if, if it has to be a case of nation first, if it has to be a case of Rashtra Sarvopari, it has to start with the distinguishing feature of people first, citizen first. And here we are, we have a wonderful opportunity. I just came, we did a one and a half hour debate before I came. <clears throat> we said, who spoiled the campaign? What are we talking about in this campaign? What is the biggest issue in this campaign? Let me tell you today's biggest issue. The Mahagadbandan has found its latest issue. They say that when we get elected, we will pick up Modi and throw him out of the country. So the biggest issue today, when the first round of voting is over and six is left, is not you, certainly not your health care. It is the pressing concern of the opposition, the immediate urgency to make sure that Narendra Modi is out of the country. If this election is all about one individual, then who we are, who are we to ask questions of either politicians or the media? The media will reflect what people think. Why are we not debating real issues? When I go to hospitals, I find a real issue of affordability. And you're correct, Dr. Puri. The biggest issue is affordability. The biggest issue is not whether doctors are being beaten up by patients in ICUs, which is a very, very, very critical issue. But are we even discussing that? We are not. Are we talking of the healthcare safety net? We are not. Are we talking about how many people can actually afford cardiac care and oncological care in this country? We are not. Are we talking about how many, how much of a gap there is today between one India which can afford its basic requirements? And I'm not talking about luxuries. I'm not talking about asparagus and avocado. I'm talking about whether people can afford potatoes to eat. Are we talking about those classes of people in this country who are now being told, we will keep you under the poverty line. You are incentivized to remain poor, which means if you continue to remain poor, we'll give you 6,000 rupees. And then your biggest fear in life is not going to be whether you become better. Your biggest fear in your life is going to be whether you are ever going to be out of the poverty net. Because the moment you are out of the poverty net, that 6,000 rupees will go away. The politicians of this country are not unleashing productivity. They are not unleashing productivity in this country. There is a 50-year-old adolescent in this country who goes around telling people, please remain poor. <laughs> what is this logic? And who says, if you remain poor, I will give you a gift. The people of this country must be told that poverty is the biggest curse in this country. And 50-year-old adolescents who have not experienced poverty, who have not worked hard, who have not made something of themselves on their own, have no right to tell the poor people of this country, I'll give you a gift to remain poor. Our country must thrive and grow. And it will thrive and grow when people begin to demand. To create demand, you must have ambition. To have ambition, you must have hunger. And to have hunger, you must have the right to demand your right. The beginning of this conference should not be about the problems that there are in India. You know, we've become a very cynical people. We have been told over years, this is bad, that is bad, this won't work, this has not worked. You ask this generation, ask an 18 year old today, can it happen? He'll say it can happen. But then the 35 year old will tell him, I, I don't think so. And the 55-year-old will tell him, it's never going to happen. <laughs> and the 75-year-old will, will say, I wish it happened, but unfortunately you are dreaming. So what does a 75-year-old tell the 18-year-old? He tells him to be cynical about change in this country. He tells him not to believe that change will happen. So when someone promises you real change, you say it's not going to happen. Today, the irony in this country is that even Peter Mukherjee can afford good medical care, but a common man cannot. The irony in this country is that if you're a criminal politician who talks to mafia dons, you can come out on parole and get yourself admitted where you want. 
but a common man cannot. 6,000 rupees a month as a throwaway gift to a poor piece of person as an incentive to remain poor will not get that person a bypass surgery for his father when he needs. And if he needs, he will stand outside the hospital with forms in triplicate and say, request you, please get this for me. And hence, none of us have any right to be cynical about Ayushman Bharat. All the medical fraternity, I appeal to you today. Forget your profit margins. Forget what you're going to get out of it. Stop cribbing about the fact that you're not making enough money. Hospital owners, doctors, please stop cribbing about the fact that it's not going to happen. It will happen. Do you know the impact of Ayushman Bharat on a poor person? Do you know how empowered they feel? I come from a family of army officers and central government servants. Go to the CGHS. Go to a military hospital. You know the biggest empowerment for a junior commissioned officer when he retires at the age of 45? Ask a Subedar Major who retires. What is the biggest gift that the government has given you? that the army has given you, he will say that I as a retired Subedar Major can take my father to the military hospital and he will get any care that he needs. We deride it, but we don't know how empowering healthcare is in our country. We are only thinking about vote banks, vote banks, vote banks. You know something, Dr. Puri? I've been a journalist now for 23 years. People tell me, why do you scream? I was not born this way. I, I, no, no, I, only, I, I only hope you did scream when you were born. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the Nikko. Good one. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, Dr. Puri, in this country, you don't scream, you will not be heard. It is the brutal reality of this country. When I met the 50-year-old adolescent in 2014, <laughs> he asked me my age, Dr. Puri. And when I told him, I said, I'm 40 years old. He said, oh, you're younger than me. I said, yes, I am, but I have 19 years of work experience. <laughs> I represent a generation which has achieved what it has on its own right. The difference between you and me is that I am not a dynast. I represent a generation of Indians that came out of college after reforms. I am not a beneficiary of entitlement. <laughs> and I want the next generation to be hungrier than I, have, than I am. But I also know what being disadvantaged in this country is. The future of this country is in its government schools, not in its dun schools. This is the reality of this country. The future of this country will be in the chores, not in the mansions. The future talent of this country, which will take this country to 10, why I predict 12% growth for India, will not be the generation of people who can walk in today to any hospital and get any health care they want and have crores of rupees in some assured insurance. It is the bunch of people in India who do not have that. Now imagine if those groups of hungry Indians living in the chores, the slums, who are fighting were to get some assurance of health care for themselves and their parents, what would we achieve as a nation? You know something? We would achieve great. Sonali, uh, you are an icon in the eyes of a lot of people. Uh, first, as a career woman who made theater, films, television, somebody who has gone through this kind of a this kind of a journey to have suddenly been detected with a, a life-threatening situation your 
career being at stake and then emerging out of it and becoming a champion protagonist for it obviously raises certain questions in the minds of a lot of us who are uh, from the medical world. First of all, would be intrusive on my part to ask you, how were you diagnosed? Where were you diagnosed? How did you get to know? Because from you, these lessons will go to a large number of people. First of all, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Dr. Patankar, Dr. Patkar, and Dr. Agarwal, they've been strong pillars in this journey of mine and uh, somewhere have been part of the beginning of this uh, phase of my life, I would say, because it is a different phase. And my husband and me, Joe, we say BC and AC, that's before cancer and after cancer. It's like a different lifetime. Uh, like you said, that uh, you know, I don't think I'm a champion in, in, in the sense of uh, uh, kind of trying to. My voice is much softer than what was going on before. I'm not here. Sorry about that. I can't really shout so much, but you were right about it that we need to demand. And what happened was that I did not look at what was happening to me and did not ask too many questions as I should have. Couple of points to that. Probably it comes from the fact that as women, without knowing in the subconscious, we are all taught sahin shakti bhot achhi baat hoti hai. So you are taught that you know what? Be tough, bear the pain. You have to bear a child, bear the pain. We are all being told that somewhere. So you kind of inter internalize that, and you are always thinking that you know what? I can bear the pain, and you can go on. And uh, I kept telling myself that I'm putting in an 18-hour day. So obviously I'm fine, I'm not dying, but I was. And when I look back and I say, how did I do that? So then the question was that, why did I put up with this pain? What was I waiting for, for me to collapse? To understand what my body was trying to tell me. So it comes down to that, that the body was sending me signals. I was not looking at it as I should have looked at it. Um, half of the time we say that, yeah, but I've told my doctor, so it should be okay. But we forget doctors are human beings too. And they're looking at, especially in our country, the kind of patients they're looking at, the kind of uh, numbers they're looking at. It's really not possible for them, you know, to blame everything on doctors and say, why didn't they not? I mean, how can they? It's my own body which was telling me and I did not listen to it. So why expect somebody else to? So I think we are already putting on a lot of burden where doctors are concerned. Um, so that's where it started for me, not listening to the sickness went in for a, a, what would you call it, a TCRE procedure? Because this are the, these are the medical terms that I know of and which here, this room people will understand. But uh, yeah, and we were suddenly, uh, we discovered that there was something in there which was causing this whole thing all this while. And uh, we came out of there and then we discovered that it was not just there, it was all over. It was spreading really fast and it had spread to a lot of areas and Basically, it was the fourth stage. So, I don't know how I had pulled it off till then, but that was the shocker. So, Sonali, uh, from the perspective of the diagnosis, from the perspective of the guidance that you received, do you have any reservations about the quality of care that you received here? Uh, not at all. But I would say I did go uh, to the US. I went to New York for my treatment. My husband was very clear about it. He said, I don't want to take any chances. And the reason I think what, I mean, I, I was uh, literally fighting with him. I'm like, my child is young, the home is here, and you know, we are just picking up. And it was literally two days after the diagnosis that we had packed our bags and we had left. And I didn't know when I was coming back, what was happening, where I was going for. It was just the two of us. We had not really had time to discuss it with too many people and we had just taken off. We had got the appointments and we had just taken off. So I kept fighting with him, saying that, you know, how can you just stop everything? But when I reached there and I got to know the extent of this, somewhere I did honestly feel, thank God I'm here. I think that comes from the fact that uh, there are a lot of things that now in hindsight I look at and it was probably an instinct. But where he came from and as he explains it to me, he said that, you know, I know we would have got great care here. And uh, 
touch wood we have the means to and the connections to and the relationships where we could uh, tap on people but the fact remains that uh, we, we went to a place where this is what they dealt with. The only disease they dealt with was this. So his logic was that if for so many years they are only dealing with cancer and its various types of cancers, so much so that the place that I went to, the entire building was dedicated to just these type of cancers. That means there has to be something in which when you are obviously doing it constantly for so many hours, there's definitely going to be more data that's collected, there's going to be more intuition that is going to be there. He said, you were at the stage where I did not want to take a chance on this. And uh, what like, in his words, what he said was that I would rather say that, oh, I, oh, you know, overthought it and I overreacted rather than later on feel that I should have done it. He said, I did not want to take that chance. And that was the reason why we went there. So, no offense and nothing. No, no not at all. What I was leading to is that in your mind's eye and in your husband's eye, it was the outcome that was probably higher in that particular hospital, maybe because of super specialization. So to you and to your husband, decision making was based not because you didn't receive the right care or would not have got the right care but because you felt that the outcomes there being super specialized in that particular area and having that expertise were high. So to you, I would say that if outcome I was at an earlier, important. Yes, it, absolutely. I would say that if I was at an earlier stage, I would have definitely not gone because I knew we could be dealing with it. But when you were at a stage where it was like, we don't know where this is going to go next, then you didn't want to take a chance on that. So, so if you were to give a message to the public, how important do you think is the determinant of quality and outcome ultimately to what you decide to do with the treatment that you're going to receive? One part is of course cost, which you just yourself uh, mentioned that you were in a position to be able to afford the cost. But my point is, uh, other than the cost, is the assurance of getting a better outcome a determinant? Absolutely it is because, uh, uh, you know, people put in their life savings to get that outcome. So, you know, anybody who can is going to try and do that. Um, education and uh, health are two uh, areas where you're really not looking at profits. You're going to put in, in spite of, even if you have less to eat, you're going to put in and that education for your children and health care for your family is something that you are going to put in your money on. When you say saving for the rainy day, these are the rainy days that you're saving for. Just so well, just sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Do you have a medical insurance? Ah, uh, but not the one now that you can use abroad. But you do have. But I do say that we need to have the insurance, and that is what takes us through. And uh, what Arna was saying is true. My father's a government servant, and CGHS plays a very important role in our family. So insurance is important, and I think in a talk that I had when I came back, also I said that in medical insurance is important. Uh, you know, half the time we think this is not going to happen to me. It's for somebody else and then when it happens is when you realize that no, it can happen to anybody and you need to be prepared. So this is something that we do need to do. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought on that but... Uh, no, no, I, I want you to keep on in this train of thought. Okay. <laughs> so tell me, how is this that in a country, uh, the driver of the car, the car is insured compulsively but the driver is not? Well, I think the employer should have the insurance for the driver also. So suppose you are the driver or I am the driver. Our car by law is insured. But we, we cannot drive on the we cannot drive on the a vehicle. So are you the asking road. me that but by the law should says there nothing. Be our regulation says nothing that you and I should be covered by insurance. So maybe this is the right thing that what he's saying. Maybe this is the voice that should be spoken about. So please and uh, yeah, and we should be discussing. But having said that, uh, there are a lot of things here that as a layman, I still don't know because it's a subject that is definitely, first of all, the medical terms frighten you. The moment you hear them, I start feeling what is happening and I start palpitating just hearing the terms. And uh, it is a disease that is scary, no doubt about it. But, you know, it is not a disease that can be diagnosed very easily. So what I'm understanding, and which obviously here, it's a room full of doctors and I can't believe I'm sitting here and saying what I'm saying and I mean, I mean I'm talking about it. But uh, I don't know the medical terms of it and I don't know how you'll arrive at the thing. But because I went through it, my journey has been that eventually what I have understood and to put it down in layman terms is, 
that early detection is what is the most important thing where this disease is concerned. Because medicine is at a stage where if you detect it early, there needn't be such invasive treatments that we have to go through. Because sometimes, right now, I think the disease is somewhat less scarier than the treatment that you go through. The treatment is actually more frightening and more painful. Uh, you feel that sometimes. So, early detection, I think, is what is the most important thing. Uh, had I detected it early, there were more chances. It would cost me less. I would be. I would go through less painful treatments. I would have more options in where the treatment was concerned also. So, uh, for me, I didn't know this disease was so prevalent because nobody talks about it. When it happened to me, I realized in my family how many people had had it and had not spoken about it. And I was like, I wish I knew. I wouldn't have thought that, oh, this is never going to happen to me. So, when I put the post out on my social media, because I was doing some work, I did not want any kind of gossip around it. And my son, you know, children are much more tech savvy. I didn't want him hearing and reading something wrong. So I wanted to put out my story myself. So when I put it out, the response that I got was what was shocking for me. Because there were people from all strata of society uh, writing in to me saying, this is what happened to my aunt, to my grandmother, to my son, to my mom, you know, everybody. And it was, there was no like a niche in society. Every strata of society they were writing in from and they were discussing it. And suddenly I said, oh, but if this has been so prevalent, why had I not heard of it? And I never knew that this could happen, it, it, that it is so rampant. I know we all say that today the pollution, the, you know, uh, the toxins and etc. Of course, they must be affecting it and they are there. But cancer is something that's been there for the longest time. Probably it was not diagnosed as often. But when so many stories you hear when they talk about their grandmothers and their grand aunts getting it, surviving it or not surviving it, either ways. So obviously it's been around for a long time. Probably it's getting diagnosed better now. But what I realized was that this was something that they were all holding on to and nobody shared it in their own families. Uh, like there was a mother who told me that, you know, my son went through it. I did not share it with my own mother because, you know, we kept it hidden. We said it was asthma. I was like, what? Why would you do that? And it's like, no, no, you know, how can you share this with people? I'm like, why would you not share it with people? What I realized by sharing was that first I heard that I was not alone, that this was not so unique, I was not so special that only I had got cancer. Everybody gets it and anybody would get it. Secondly, everybody kept saying that, how could you get it? You are so healthy, your lifestyle is so good, how could you get it? And I kept asking myself that question, that why have I got it? And then I realized it's genes, you know, it's not something that, uh, definitely if you have the genetic predisposition to it or whatever, your toxins and the environment and the way you lead your life will definitely affect that will affect for a, any other illness also. Leading a healthy life is a basic, you know, basic thing for any sort of disease, not just for cancer. So other than that, I realized that I was not alone, that there were a lot of people out there who were not talking about it. So the next post was to thank people for sharing their stories because it made me feel less alone. It made me feel like part of a community. And then the stories, what I started putting out was more of saying, thank you for sharing. And the fact that, you know what, why are we not talking about it? Because what I found when I shared it was that I got a lot of love. I got so much of love that I didn't know I had so much of love. I didn't know so many people cared about me. So that was one thing that I realized. And I thought that was a great thing to realize. Even if I died, at least I would have died knowing that I, lo I was loved so much. So it was a great way to go there. Thankfully, I haven't. But yes, uh, having said that, when you talk about something, also you're discussing various options, various things. You come, you come to know different uh, things that can be done, can't be done. Have you tried it? So as like anything else, it's a community and you need to discuss things. And uh, what I realized when I came back was that we need to make it an open thing. It's not something that you should be hiding and that you should be, uh, you know, keeping it within the family because your the mental state is going to go down the hill because you're living in that pain and the trouble and your uh, caregivers are also hiding it. Nobody has a place where they can vent and share and, you know, that takes a toll on your mental health and then that's taking the toll on how you recover from it. So it's a vicious circle. So the thing that I can do in my capacity when, when, when I was called here also was that yes, if my voice can be heard and if me talking about it makes people share their stories and talk about it, I'm happy to do that. One final question. Uh, you know, the most important thing you mentioned which drove you to go to a particular institution for treatment was that the outcomes were good. 
But the question that I wanted to ask you, and if through you perhaps this message would go, that you know, when we as Indians look at buying jewelry, not we as Indians, you as Indians, I can't afford it. Uh, when, when the rich people go and buy jewelry, not a jewelry person, uh, uh, they, they look for hallmark. You know, when you go and buy a woolen product, you look for wool mark. You, even an agricultural guy, when he goes and buys fertilizer, he looks for agri mark. Why don't Indians, or did you, in particular, look for any mark which certifies that this hospital is good quality? Well, I didn't know there was an organization called CAR. To be honest, this is what I came to know now and I'm so happy that there is something which is like a benchmark, which is basically, uh, like you said, an ISI kind of a certification is what you look for, right? When, in this is well, the place you should be going for. Kaho represents and the accreditation right. uh, body and then it's all over the world. So, so the now hospital you went if, to if in the United will, States also has accredited. So right, so what is the accreditation? Accreditation means, accredit yeah, sir. So, so through like you, there is there are all these uh, uh, ads that go out which say that you know Jagood, Grahab, Jagood. No, and ISI mark they go, hall mark they go. So maybe you guys should also be advertised. So would you be able to do our do, of the, course. do this as an our ambassador? Of course. I think this is, a, this is a, the best way to end it. So ladies and gentlemen, one more. I would like to say a couple of things more. <laughs> which is one more thing. When you said, when you go, the, if there's a difference between what is happening in the US and what is happening here and all that, I do have two, three things that we need to look into much more and I don't know and I'm happy and open to sit and contribute in any way that I can. But what I discovered was that genetic testing is important. So when there are hospitals that have a cancer department, why are, you know, you have constantly decover and karo, ye karo. There are so many posters that you put out. Why don't you put more posters on get your testing done, checkups done? Why don't we talk more about cancer? Even the hospitals don't talk about cancer. Even the doctors are so scared to say the big C. Though cancer is like one, like a big umbrella. And then when I get it, I realize that every cancer is like a different disease altogether. It's like just one big umbrella which covers, God knows, probably 40 different kinds of diseases or more. So why aren't the hospitals also putting up more of these things and talking about it a lot more and you do blood banks and this bank. So let's do more talks about it so that you will reach grassroots levels. We'll talk about media but half the time I don't see the news because I find it only bad news come out and I'm not looking at it at all. But when you do grassroots levels and when you do things in hospitals, people who are sitting there waiting for the doctor are reading it. At least I do read what is happening and try to follow it. So maybe we should also do that. Yeah, but I'd just like to add, uh, for, from on behalf of doctors, that doctors make errors. To make errors... We all do. Uh, and human make, beings make that. Yeah, make, I don't think we should hold that. Yeah, way. to make errors is uh, human. But to blame it on others requires management skill. So we have a lot of managers. Okay, so all the managers have to do so this. They have to do this. Guys, it's obvious. Put it all in your laps. Thank you very much. So you have to do this. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please give her a standing ovation. We do that. We do that. But thank you so much. I'm I was really petrified about being here in front of all the doctors and talking on these medical terms. But uh, I mean what I said over here. That if there is any way that I can, in my way, help out, and which is if me talking about something helps out. I would love to get the data on it and be the person who talks about it. But until I know it myself, so there needs to be a place from where I can get it. So if I can be provided with that, I would love to focus on it and, you know, kind of amplify it as you say. But I don't know it. I'm not a medical person. So I'm a lay person. I need to be told that and I'm happy to learn. Thank All you so say much. All uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And may God bless you with a healthy and a long life. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you everybody, thank you for having me. I'd like to call upon stage Mr. Joy Chakravarti, CEO of Hinduja Hospital, Dr. Rajendra Patankar, CEO of Hinduja Hospital, Dr. Patkar, Medical Director Medical Services, Nanavati Hospital, and Dr. Vishesh Agarwal, Consultant Internal Medicine, to felicitate Ms. Sonali Vendra Pahal. Thank you so much ma'am for taking time out of your busy schedule.
understand that she has to leave because of prior commitment. So a big round of applause for her.